<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our, our one o'clock session, H5P for collaboration and engagement in online environments with our presenters, Laura Pazell, Nick Poss, and Kristen Gregory. Welcome, thank you. Hello everyone, I hope you're doing okay and that you're not too sleepy after having lunch. So I'm just gonna open up with our introduction. And so uh, we work for the University of Central Oklahoma at the Center for E-Learning and Connected Environments. And this workshop is basically an overview of what H5P is and how it incorporates the community of inquiry framework into online learning. And so we're gonna have some demonstrations of the various types of interactive learning that can be created and added to your online courses. And so this is basically a demo rather than hands-on training. And you'll get lots of tips and tricks are gonna be provided and you'll have time for questions at the end of the workshop. And so our learning objectives is by the end of the session that you'll be able to recall what H5P is and how it can be used in a variety of fun and enhanced, really cool ways in the online learning environment and have an understanding and overview of the community of inquiry framework and why it's important to be used in online courses. And so we're gonna begin first by showing you the examples of H5P, and then we'll explain what the community of inquiry framework is, the COI, and then we'll help reinforce the engagement aspects of H5P in online environments. So now Nick will present. One second, I'm gonna start sharing our screen for our Zoom peeps real quick. All right. Yeah. Okay. Hey everyone, my name is Nick Poss. Um, and first off, thank you for coming to our session. Um, it's been inspiring today to hear all these ideas and presentations from people that are also passionate about creating better online learning environments. So thank you for uh, all the other presentations that I've gotten to go to before um, presenting here. So I'm here to talk about H5P. H5P is a user-friendly, intuitive tool that allows course designers to insert interactive activities onto pages in whatever LMS you're using. So let me show you what I mean. So this is a sample page that I made uh, on D2L. And this is an example of what our pages would have looked like before we started using H5P. You'll see there's a lot of text explaining concepts. We've got some images, and then we can also embed videos. Um, but what's missing here and what is possible with online pages like this is to create activities that students can do to sort of like practice or assess their understanding um, in a more informal way than if they were taking a quiz or doing an assignment that was graded. So let me show you what using H5P would look like. So keep in mind, these activities are just some of the activities that are available with H5P. So, um, but here we used an H5P activity to uh, just kind of test the student's understanding initially of this concept hardwoods versus softwoods. So um, you can kind of like test your understanding here. So what do y'all think? Is a pine tree a hardwood, softwood? Hardwood. Let's see. Oh, it's a softwood. I know. What about an ash tree? Okay. Okay, that's pretty good, pretty good. You did. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. What about a yew tree? No? Okay. The moment of truth. Oh, it's a softwood. What about balsa wood? Let's see. Oh, it's a hardwood. Yeah, it really is. It has to do with like how the seeds are protected on the tree, not how dense the wood is. So um, I'll send you all the full HTML page. You can read it later. Um, but uh, yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you guys, we need some work, pay close attention. Um, so that's an example of one exercise that you can use. Another exercise that you can use that we find is really popular at our institution are the interactive videos. So here, this is a YouTube video. And the cool thing about um, with H5P, we can leverage this content and then add an additional layer of instruction on it. So you're not gonna hear audio, but imagine you're a student in this course and you're watching this video and instead of just sort of like passively watching the video, maybe you have it on in the background while you're cooking or something, but all of a sudden questions pop up and you have to answer these questions to advance in the video. What I really like about this is I find that a lot of uh, faculty members are hesitant to use YouTube videos because it feels like they're giving up their uh, their voice, like their instruction. But you can add another layer of instruction here and then leverage the excellent resource that YouTube is. Um, and keep in mind, uh, an interesting statistic is that there are 32,000 hours of content uploaded to YouTube every hour. So there's new stuff being added all the time. And then even if there aren't a lot of things specific to your discipline right now, which I find that hard to believe, um, but if for some reason there's a uh, there's a lack of content there, I'm sure that will change in the future. And you can leverage the really well produced, well thought out content on YouTube, and once again add a faculty member's layer of commentary on that. And with this tool, you don't just have to add questions; you can also link to your own videos, so you could then provide commentary instead of uh, asking a question like this. Another pro of H5P is that it's easily, uh, you can train faculty members easily to use this. Now it takes a little bit of trial and error to get used to the interface and to see what works, but I just wanted to show you really quickly what it would look like to create an H5P exercise on this page. And keep in mind, it's not a technical demonstration, so I'm gonna go pretty fast. I just kinda wanna show you what the interface looks like. Um, but another benefit of this is that H5P has a really active community. And so if you ever have questions about how to do something in particular, um, you can normally find it on their uh, message boards. So I'm inserting an H5P exercise right now. And you'll see, these are all the different types of activities that you can experiment with and so add free. in. So free. This is not, it's free for the student. Institutions okay. have to pay to use it. But that is, that's a good point though, is that like for students, it's free. They don't have to create an account to interact with it. It's all embedded on the pages. So this is all in D2L that they're able to do this. Start. Hmm? It says Zoom and slide. That's, I, do we have to hit start there? I think we need to hit that. I'm not sure. Do we have to hit that start button? Zoom, Zoom question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, so there are a variety of different types of exercises, but this is what it would look like to create one. Um, and I'm going to go pretty quick here, but this is an image hotspot. So we're able to add um, some commentary to an image. I just so happen to have the Sherman tree in my downloads. But we can add little spots that students can interact with. that students can interact with and then add like an additional level of commentary to images. So that's what it would look like. So that's an example of how you can utilize H5P and a little overview of what H5P is. Um, and we're gonna move on to our next presentation. I feel this is a little restrictive for me. I don't really like it. I'm going to see if I can cancel out. See if that. Okay. Can you guys hear me? All right. Okay. So I'm going to show you. He he did a great introduction when it comes to H5P and kind of how it's used. Um, 
what he um, showed you was a list and he was kind of scrolling through what you need to know there's like over 40 options of H5P available. Some of them have a little bit of a lower learning curve, others have a little bit of a steeper learning curve. My suggestion to all faculty before they get started with H5P is to maybe take a look at that list, make note of just maybe two or three that really pique their interest and start there because otherwise you might get super overwhelmed and kind of get lost in it and then that's where you you kind of like, ah, I don't think this is going to work for me. Um, so what you're going to see here, I've got these divided. And so there's only a couple of um, options that I'm showing you as far as um, the four here are talking about social presence. So they're the only ones in H5P where students can actually engage and interact with one another, right? The others are more kind of a cognitive presence and we're always looking to enhance engagement, level up our courses, take something that maybe we had in a Word document PDF or a PowerPoint presentation and we're just simply uploading it to the LMS and finding a way to really raise that engagement, um, find that, active learning possibility to where students can have a more immersed learning experience. So low learning curve, moderate to steep learning curve. When we're looking at low learning curve, we're really talking about from the, the author, which is what H5P uses as the people who are building these interactives. So um, they're in, we, we call them interactive uh, learning objects or LOs, okay? So you're, you're asked first asking yourself, where do I begin? So like a drag the word activity, that's all you're building. It's that's the only type of content that's available within that interactive. Whereas a quiz question set, there's probably going to be eight or nine learning objects from H5P that you have as options to choose from. So that means there's gonna maybe need to be a little bit more planning and development, right? Um, and so that's when, when you're kind of looking through, where do I begin? That's the question you're asking, how many pieces of content, how many variations of content is actually available within this particular learning object selection, okay? So just moving back up to the top with social, here the first two a word cloud emoji cloud that's just a single learning object you can only choose a word cloud and the options or decisions that you're making with this word cloud um, do you want the students to type in their response or do you want to provide them perhaps these five words and they have to select and then whichever one is most frequently selected would then become enlarged in that word cloud. So that's the decision making. So when you're talking about time spent on um, choosing this as a potential option of something you might want to bring into your classroom, you're talking maybe 10, 15 minutes as far as decision making and planning and developing, right? You access it. There's one question you're presenting and then you're deciding, do I want them to type? How many responses? One response, five responses, like what's the situation there, right? Same thing with like the uh, emoji cloud. Let me see. <clears throat> So the emoji cloud is another really fun one. Students love emojis. I think even adults love emojis now. We're, we're all on it. Um, I used to kind of be told if you respond with an emoji, you're being completely unprofessional. And now the president's responding with emojis, right? So <laughs> it's allowed. Um, so with the emoji option, decision making, when you're talking about planning and development, we're talking about there's 30 different emojis to select. You can select up to six. This particular instructor really wanted to do um, a weekly check-in. This was um, a zero level math course and students have to master concepts every week to as they progress throughout the semester and um, if they start to fall behind they may not pass that class well this is a zero level math course students don't want to have to repeat this right they're not earning credits so often these types of when you're looking at the social present instructor presence or using some of these interactives um our instructors are using these to uh, basically get guidance, kind of take the pulse of the class, 
use that, you know, what kind of feedback, use it for feedback, maybe they need, the students need more guidance or tutorials or something like that, right? So, um, but also, so this was an example of where that was used to kind of take the pulse of the class. Whereas you could also, um, let me see. So this is not my computer, so there we go. The multipole would be, when we're talking about planning and development, still a great one, um, really good for facilitating polls or debates in the classroom. And if you'll click side by side right there for me, the side by side option. Um, planning and development, this is one that just has like seven or eight learning objects to choose from, right? So you can add in pictures, you can add in a word cloud, you can, um, let me expand this a little bit. Let's see if we can get it full screen. Um, so very fun, but you're, there's more questions that you might need to kind of think about how you want to order them. I put in a nice little image at the top, introduced it. Um, this one here is a word cloud. So that's where they are typing in a response, right? Whereas this one here is I've given them an option and now they are selecting a response, right? And then as I'm building this, I'm also saying, well, what I think would be nice next would be maybe a little image. And then I'm asking them, how do they feel about this particular in-person type classes? Um, if they do go to a classroom, this is like an image where they can select where might they stand. So very interactive or sit, pick to sit. So these are those decisions when you're deciding how you want to this to flow. These are more content options. So it just takes a little more time. So building the word cloud would take me 15 minutes, whereas this one from top to bottom might take me an hour. Um, and that's kind of trying it out and then um, saying, yep, this is how I like it. This is what I want. And then um, giving it a go. Right. And so how do you expand it or make it small again? OK, um, so, so all of the social presence, these types of interactive live engagement options, you can download results and um, have that it's downloaded to an Excel doc, CVS doc or whatever. Um, you can reset the games. You can have them open for as long as you want or make it a very narrow thing. So they work great, whether it's in the online environment, but as well as in a face to face environment. The chase is just where you can actually hold live competitions. So when we're talking about can can this be done in an online environment? Yes. And they, they're very easy to build and um, students absolutely love them. And when instructors actually take decide to jump off the cliff and say, OK, I'm going to tip. I'm going to go ahead and give this a go. They are now hooked. They're addicted. And as we continue to redesign courses, they might have only started with one or two. And now we're seeing them in all the modules on some level. OK, so the next two here that's in view. I mean, I, I keep talking about planning and development and you keep hearing me say learning curve. So when you're learning any kind of new thing, it takes a second to get oriented, because if it's the first time you've had any kind of contact with it, it's disorienting, right? So with my faculty are like, well, I don't really have time to go through all of them and look at them and you know, take this deep dive into it. What do you, where do you suggest I begin? Um, these right here, these four here are the ones that I are go to with drag the words being the number one. Okay. So imagine there's some, um, uh, imagine you have a, a document that has bolded terms and definitions and students are supposed to know those and it's really important that they that you give them access to it but so you're just going to upload it to your LMS they're going to have to print it and they're just kind of reading through in a very passive way and it's up to them to kind of figure out how they want to study and you know and, and engage with that this simply here is a you copy and paste this is what this is whoops that's what I was afraid of hold on um you just copy and paste that content that's already existing. And when you paste it into the drag the words, um, right here where you, where it says 
draggable word. All you're doing to build this is add asterisks around the words that you want to be moved. Okay. So this was one that um, a faculty member did a, a short little lecture on and then use this. They had little notes of kind of the nuggets, the key ideas that they wanted to make sure that they understood and there were basically four different terms. So to test their knowledge in a way, she created a drag the, drag the words experience. So we are now, um, can you move them? Because that one little thing, just, and it doesn't matter what order, but now instead of um, just having students read and come across the words that they may have in bold, they are now having to think through that text and do they really recall what was shared with them and how well did they do or do they need to go back and take another look? So again, we're talking about going from a passive situation to a more engaging active situation as they are testing their knowledge, right? And all of these interactives can be, um, uh, you can provide feedback, they can just be practice situations or they can be linked to your gradebook and they can be gradable items. And those are just some of the decisions you're making when um, you're choosing. So the ones at the top here, uh, what's the drag the words, the cross, uh, a crossword puzzle, similar thing, you're identifying something and then you're, ha you're having them go through different concepts and engage with it in just a little bit of a unique, unique way. Students love the novelty of it, to be honest. They're used to just having, um, pieces of paper uploaded LMSs and then having to do downloads and printing or look at it in that way and come up with folders. So this is very active right there. The reason the quiz set and the dialogue cards are um, kind of at the bottom of the list is because of the decision making that you kind of have to do when creating these. Again, they're not difficult. So um, I'll just show you a crossword real quick. When we're talking about um, instructor presence. This was an instructor who put a little blurb. Whoops. Sorry about that, guys. Sorry. Put a little blurb and their little special right here at the top about why this is important. This was a practice activity, but it helps drive the motivation to actually maybe engaging in the this interactive, right? Um, going back to the um quiz set so again test students knowledge or maybe you want to just kind of know where are they at where are they starting with so this is an example of a quiz and so all of the h5p has just multiple choice options so every if you're building it you could just insert one multiple choice question or you could have 50 multiple course multiple choice questions um, this one, because it's a quiz set, it's at allowing a variation. So not only are they having maybe multiple choice options, but they are also having maybe mark the words. That's a single learning object or multi select as an option, right? Um, you can also have the choice, it's not mandatory, but you can choose to insert feedback if you want. So students do really well when you're able to give them feedback, um, especially when it's instant. And so a lot of the H5P interactives are really great for formative forms of assessment, right? Those low stakes and or practice exercises, things like that. Um, this one here, the dialogue cards, we, I, I'll play around with it for just a second, but you're actually going to get to use it in just a moment. Um, this was one that was an in-class activity where the faculty member put these scenarios on the board and would ask them questions and then students would have to give an answer. So there's like six different stages that they would have to choose from. So they would call out and then they would discuss why is it in this stage or not, right? Well, this little button here for someone who's not getting that in-person experience, but still wanting to have a more enriching experience. Now there's where the teacher can kind of, or the faculty can put in their comments uh, that would have been that enriching experience that would have been in the face-to-face 
course, you know, those little special things. And right there, it can be video, it can be text, it can be images. So it's just a way to really enhance learning um, in a profound way. So again, think, think of terms, uh, think of flashcards, but then also here's an example of like a scenario right, where you're kind of going through it and they're getting to interact with that content. A lot of um, H5P stuff is being used for those golden nuggets, those little pieces that the teacher just do not, or the faculty does not want them to just pass by as they're reading something. They're kind of pulling them out and then highlighting them and presenting them in a way that's very active. So the ones down here, uh, just to kind of go through this a little quicker, you, you've already seen an interactive video and you've also seen an image hotspot situation, and I'll show you an example of a few, but the moderate learning curve. What that means is that you have a few more options and it might take a little bit of practice as the author or the person who's building this to really get the hang of it. So you're going to do something and then you're gonna save it, preview it and say, ooh, I like that, but I wanna change it here or there. So pretty much, devote an hour or more to the planning, developing, and creation of this. When I'm helping people who are wanting to do this, if I'm not the subject matter expert, then it depends on what kind of information that they give me on how quickly I can move through it. So um, one might take me just a couple of hours to pull together for them, and then we're just doing some very minor tweaks, whereas if they were working on it, it might have only taken them an hour because they already know what they want, right? Um, so just like Nick kind of showed, there's different possibilities. And so just to um, bring to light, you can see multiple choice question. There's, um, I think there's volume going. Ah. Um, you know, there's other kind, all, the mark the words options. There's the drag the drop, drag the drop you would think is easy but there's a couple of different layers to it that it can be disorienting but once you figure out the flow of how you're supposed to put things in what order all of a sudden everyone loves it and there's drag and drops all through their courses right but you kind of have to slow down that first time that you do it so really great this one's really catching fire at uco um the hot spot is another really good one not sure why it's not showing um, and the timeline. So with the timeline, this faculty gave us a um, handout or sent and it was like five pages in length. So imagine that's what's being handed to students, <laughs> uploaded as some document that they have to download and try to figure out how to digest and do something with, right? And so what's cool about timelines um, you can have text, you can have add video, you can add pictures. Um, again, just kind of the layout of it is just a little bit more engaging and digestible as students are interacting with your content. And then lastly, yeah, because the pages were so long. Yeah, it, three instructional designers teamed up to pull this together for this one faculty member. So, and she was just fine, happy, just given the document to the students to figure out what to do with, right? And so um, us pulling this together, it wasn't that it uh, was hard and it took three smart people to try to figure out how to do it. It was just time consuming, right? Because there were so many things that needed to be added on it and trying to get her to maybe consider uh, trimming and, you know, focusing. And anyways, it might've been better to break it into certain errors and have three different timelines. Uh, you kind of have to work with what you get, but um, still for the students now, we're always thinking about what's the student's experience and this now being presented in this way, students are going to enjoy encountering that content way more than a five page list of stuff that's just super overwhelming, right? Now they can actually look at a video. They can actually look at a picture that's associated with it or something more, right? And then the branching scenario, I would not say that this one um, is difficult for me if I'm not the subject matter expert. Creating a branching scenario for someone would be difficult for me, but not the subject matter expert because they know what the consequences are. They know what how they how things need to proceed. But we're still talking about 
planning and development, right? Having an idea of what kind of scenarios or dilemmas or situations you're wanting to present somebody and then have how they should, if they select this, what comes up? What are two or three things? Where does it lead the students? But again, sometimes we might do some sort of active learning in a face-to-face -face class and we're like, I can't even wrap my brain around how to create some sort of learning experience in the online environment that mimics this. Well, branching scenario is a great solution for those who are interested in. And now your online students are having a more engaging experience as they are going through your course. Um, so I'm going to, uh, turn it over to Laura. She's going to actually talk to you in more detail about the community of inquiry framework. Okay. So before we get started, I just want to say that I love H5P. I'm an H5P junkie. Okay. I actually, they think I'm crazy. But I use H5P outside of D2L now for all of my presentations. So, okay, so the Community of Inquiry Framework. And so what this is, it theorizes how we can create and maintain classroom community. And it's based on John Dewey's practical inquiry model. And so we need to put into practice so thinking about your course documents and your interactive interactions, materials, and, and to do so, we use this pedagogy model, which is called the Community of Inquiry, which we'll call COI framework. And if you see this little question mark, so what I did with my learning object is called an interactive learning object. It includes a presentation, an infographic, an accordion, and also flashcards. So let's see. Yeah, I can that. Okay. So let me tell you about the community of inquiry framework. So this is a definition of a community. It's a group of learners who are interacting collaboratively through discourse and discussion to construct meaning. So this idea goes way back to John Dewey, okay? So he's the one who started the practical inquiry model. And that includes many of these ideas and concept of the social const constructivist theory. And so it's derived from this knowledge that you think about construction, that it has to be collaborative and it has to be continuous, like a round circle in order for it to be effective. And so when this COI framework was developed in the late 90s by Garrison and Shale, they said, you know, it has to be the sustained continuous two-way communication and it became the hallmark for distance education. And that allows learners to negotiate personal meaning knowledge and the educational transactions that occur like in a traditional classroom. And so part of that, part of the social presence is the students have to be perceived as real people. So in order for them to do that, they have to be able to project themselves into the online environment in a way socially and emotionally. And often this can also mean that they have to be vulnerable. And our instructors also have to have that ability to also be a little bit vulnerable to be able to do that. Then we have the cognitive presence. And so when you think about cognitive presence, you need to think about all the things that are happening so the students are learning, right? You're thinking about how they're gonna think, listen, learn, and identify what it is that you wanna teach them, right? And so what happens is you have this four phase process. You have triggering events. So that's where they're taking like a case study or they have like a, a research project or something like that, where they have to go and do further inquiry and further study. And then you have exploration. That's where the students are exploring the issues together. And they have uh, either a group or individually, and they have a chance to, to discuss and have critical reflection and discourse. And then you have integration. That's where it all comes together. And that's where the learners are having this meaning 
during the exploration process. And then resolution, that's where they apply the newly gained knowledge in the, in the educational setting or the workplace. And so the best part, of course, is the spark, which is the instructor's presence. The instructors provide the spark of the learning. And that begins at thinking of the, as the instructional designer for the online course, because when instructors are teaching online, let's face it, it's, it's more work, right? More work. They have to plan and prepare the course of the studies. It continues during the course as the instructor facilitates discourse, providing instruction when required. Now I'm gonna show you this infographic. So here you have this infographic that's, you know, you can find this on the web. So you have the social presence, you have the cognitive presence, the teaching presence, all of this over, overlaps to create this great educational experience for your students. But the instructors are the spark. Okay, now we're going to go over with the flashcards. So now we're going to, you guys all want to come up. We also have this handout on the tables. And there's also a text that you can find online that shows this on one side, all the interactions and the COI, with also a link to a great website by the researchers of the Community of Inquiry Framework. You can find it on the Zoom room events. So the first part we're going, the first flashcard is cognitive. Can everybody see that okay? So look at the topic and think of ways that you can incorporate learning for the cognitive presence. So anyone from the audience wants to give, an, give us an idea or a holler? So here are these ideas. So setting the high expectations for students in query. And that's when you think of the H5P, drag the words assignments, creating the interactive presentations, using the timelines, image hotspots. I don't think we had a chance to show you the image hotspots yet. But also you can do the crossword puzzles or quizzes, creating scenarios and dilemmas all kinds of fun things. Okay, so now from the social, what do you guys remember from the social aspect of H5P that you could use? The word clouds, yes. Anyone else? The emojis, yes. What might some of them be used for? In what kind? In, in what way? What are you hoping to stimulate? Like a poll as a word cloud. Okay. Yeah. Like I like the instruction. If you want to have the students are in the same context, then you can do you can do a word cloud and get some. Yeah, I, I think that's a place where H5P really shines because it's easy to miss that. Like in the online environment, the interactions you would have in a face to face classroom to where a student, like as you're explaining, they raise their hand and they're like, wait, is this kind of like that? Or, and then you get the opportunity to dialogue with them if you can build those opportunities for the students to kind of test their understanding into the pages. Like, I think that that helps separate or like create an additional level besides this wall of content delivery and assessment that we can kind of like fall into in developing online classes. Yeah, and the other tip is to think about self-reflection because that's really important of how the students are presenting their real selves is by having those opportunities of self-reflection uh, and also uh, creating a humanizing environment by having creating a survey uh, in H5P and you can ask them questions like, is there anything that is happening in my life that could prevent me from succeeding this semester? Or you could create like a, a rosebud and a thorn question, like what is working out really well for me? What is something that could be a barrier to my learning? You know, th those types of things to help them to have uh, the self-reflection.
Okay, now we're going to talk about the instructor's presence. So with the instructor's presence, just like in the face-to-face -face classroom is setting the clear expectations for your students, it's very critical in the online environment to do that and to be visibly present in your online course at least four days per week, inject knowledge from diverse sources, and use your announcement to ensure that the students are aware of responsibilities, due dates, and other activities. Okay, now we can have uh, time for questions. Now I'll turn it back over to Kristen. Um, yeah, or any of us, what mm -hmm. questions do you have? Yeah. Well, first of all, these are really beautiful things. I, I love what you have done in your book. We are filing hrc.com to be free, and we are trying to do that. Um, okay, so this is very yeah. We're trying to figure out whether it would work better to have the instructor to have the privilege, you know, we have women and more processes, whether it would be better to have the instructor as privilege and just sort of turn them into or use more of a developing model to license for instructional designers and other developers who can get the faculty to develop their own but to try to develop that. Or whether it's kind of do a hybrid of that where we have some instructors who are kind of ambassadors who can take it, run with it, and tell their colleagues. What do you all do? How, how are you? Doing? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, everyone at our university, faculty and staff, have access to the full license of H5P. We really wanted to empower our faculty to have that control and ability that um, to have access to something that as they are designing their courses, thinking through different ways in which they can enhance their, their courses, that they could have that access to something that for full power you can get out there and get done. We do have faculty who are a little bit more up to speed visually and things like this do not intimidate them much. So they just jump right in and different than myself or any of us that when HIP was first introduced, it was a quarantine, it was learning, we kind of have to go through the pains of learning, right? And figuring it out, but we were motivated, excited and doing it. So we have faculty that do that without needing any kind of assistance or training from us. So ambassadors are a really good idea. Um, if that's something you can keep doing with everyone with the license, maybe identifying those who are willing to take it on and learn. Um, we have a, a select amount of people who have the articulate storyline license, right? That's uh, have a steep learning curve. They can still do a lot of the same things as H5P, but that removes the faculty from having access to something and or having to put on all the content to have to pay for themselves and learn. So H5P really is something we want faculty to learn how to do and build and figure out how to do themselves. Whereas if they were using the storyline, that's something we would want to them to come to us and kind of tell us what they're wanting and then have the team member build it for them and embed it in edit. Then we come back and make those edits and edit. So my recommendation, if at all possible, give it um, have it to where everyone has access to it. So that they can sandwich, maybe try some of the lower learning curve variants before we can start putting it in the courses because H5P really does have a lot of resources, examples, tutorials, all kinds of support that they don't need to lean heavy on having just a few people. But if you do that, it will be essential that your university offer has some technology support on some level. So our TRC. Um, the Technology Resource Center, they are knowledgeable at HIP. They are offering workshops and training. CC, uh, the Center for E-Learning and Connected Environment, all of us have played around with it. We are offering workshops and training and are throwing out to all faculty who are currently experiencing that if they encounter some sort of issue or need help, 
to reach out to us instead of we're doing one on one appointments with them. So that has kind of um, uh, has it made our load heavy because we were just doing instructional training, just kind of dealing with um, a couple of faculty designers here and there, and now we are starting to get reached with customers of people we need to work for, or they've gotten wind that we were a little excited about it. They were like, oh, I don't know, you probably never met with a huge contact or a reach out to Meg, and they just pass our emails all around, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, I'm having to help because I'm an extra hour or two that we're not working this morning, right? So those are things that you need to think about. As people get into it, they are going to encounter situations where they might need someone to help support them. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very well said. I'm just wondering if you all have any knowledge of the accessibility of these schools. That kind of concerns me a little bit with all the cool stuff. Yes, they are accessible. And I'm going to let Nick speak on that. They actually have a list of all the ones that um, are passing all the accessibility tests. But I'll let him speak. So really quickly, just to make sure that our people on Zoom can hear, there was a question asked about the accessibility of these exercises. And um, they are, the accessibility is clear and upfront as far as there are some exercises that may be less accessible, more accessible. Um, but I will say it's also an interesting tool to make some tables or graphics that were like explain information well that may not have been as accessible as some other things. So we've actually used the image hotspots on PDFs that demonstrate like, you know, concepts flowing one into another, but then there's a way that that's organized in a way that makes sense for uh, screen readers as well. Um, so you can actually use that to increase your accessibility in some circumstances. Oh, and one other thing too that I want to bring up is that all of these exercises work on mobile phones as well. I find that the majority of my students are using that um, to make their way through the HTML pages. So something to be aware of. And one more thing that we didn't get a chance to cover because it's a whole other class is that all of the learning objects in each life can get this. They're all reusable. So it's perfect for OER. And there are many that I've been to this OER press book and I downloaded several into my library, and a lot of them were like really cool, like interactive or like branching scenarios. I found one for our instructor who teaches, um, what is that class Janet Handiwork teaches again? Safety. Oh, the, the, the occupation on safety. So I was able to download from the, from the OER library, uh, one on safety in buildings, and then she added that to her class. And so that's like the next, workshop that we'll have to do hopefully soon and explain to you guys how to uh, the reuse of the H5P objects. Other questions out there? Yes. Sure. Yeah. So the question was, are the exercises automatically accessible or automatically um, sort of like open source, correct? Um, there's a setting that you have to set inside the exercise that makes it public, um, but there's also ways to uh, manipulate those settings to where maybe you could just share it within a department or you could share it within like a group of uh, instructors or course designers or faculty members who are working hard to create these resources. Or clone um, it. Yeah, or clone it. Um, and you can modify it between um, instructors. Um, but yeah, that's possible. And the accessibility um, is baked into it. Now, there are ways that you could get around that, right? If you don't put um, descriptive text for images and things like that, but that's built into the process of going through it. If we were to go through the process of building one of these slowly, like a technical demo, you would see the opportunities to be able to add those levels of accessibility. Um, but yeah, just like anything, you could make an image uh, decorative, right? But uh, it prompts you to go through that process. Yeah. Well, I asked earlier about the test if they were free. Um, is there, if they're, uh, you can download them from test books and use them. Uh, is, is there like a tier? I don't mean you know, to focus so much on the price. I just want to know, like, can we adopt it or go into? Absolutely. Um, and 
Kristen, can you repeat that for the mm -hmm. people in the Zoom call just so yeah. we can hear the question? Go ahead. Okay, so the question was, is there a tiered type of membership or is this free or how is how does the pricing work um, with kind of the idea of like, what does it take for an organization to get this involved with how they're creating online courses? So you can go to h5p.com and they have some advantages for free, and not just the full package for free. So here at UCO, we have the full package. So all the four year different options that you can choose from, our faculty are not limited. So they're going to get to do the chase, and then you get to do ranging scenarios, and then you get to do some of the more immersive types of HIP, where maybe on HIP.com, they might just give you a sample of a few of those, which you only took. Right, but you can purchase a small little license yourself, and then you can go for the full big one package and try to get it to everyone at your university. Um, so lots of great opportunities. But mentioning the OR, uh, OER, right? They're almost done. So you guys, right now, can go out to press books like you already mentioned. You can find HIP interactives. You can download those, and you can put those into your course, just like you would add in a YouTube video. You don't have to have a license to use those, right? Um, it's just if you want to create it and you know kind of take that next step, right? Then you might have to go for a kind of access package. And they are almost done to where worldwide you're going to have full access to tons of we are already created eight questions and all kinds of subject matter. They are almost done wrapping it up. So definitely keep your eyes open and bookmark this once it comes because you're, it's going to open your world. You're not having to, what I would like to say, I don't want to recreate the will. <laughs> I don't mind editing and changing some things, but sometimes it's just nice to see some real good examples and then just tweak it to make it my own. Flow. It doesn't matter if they're undergraduate students or graduate students. Um, it really, when, when you're talking about wanting to be able to maybe engage in a higher level as far as an interactive, you're, they have options for those. Yeah. It's just going to take a little more planning and development to create those, right, interactives. Um, again, just go to h5p.com or h5p.org. You can look at all the different um, variations or what we call content types or learning topics that they have available. And then you can, with your content in mind, of how you think you might want to use it, say, oh, this one seems really interesting. Um, I want to actually dabble and kind of play around with that. But as subject matter experts, you know what your students need, you know what maybe you've done in the past. And when you're looking at those, you're just asking yourself, how can I use this to enhance that? But I'm telling you, when they are embedded in the course, faculty are like, I don't know if this is going to work. The feedback that we're getting, they love it. And they're just growing and adding more and more. And they love the novelty of it. And like we mentioned, the cell phones are super responsive. So on any device, but unlike something that would have to, have to be downloaded and you don't know if it's going to open up on a computer or open up on their phones, that is completely something that is no longer an obstacle that our students are having to encounter. And um, another idea that just kind of popped into my head from when I was a graduate student. So there was a class that I was taking um, and with a lot of like upper level learning history is like an auxiliary thing. Right. But you have to have a good understanding of uh, the historical movements to really understand the concepts or understand how your work fits into the canon of whatever discipline you're in. Um, so I thought it might be an interesting exercise to have students um, assign them areas of a timeline. Uh, that maybe over the course of a century, all these different events happened. They organize it in a way that they understand it, maybe in a Google Doc, maybe handwritten, and they submit a picture. And then the professor can organize that into a timeline. So then everybody can see the combined work 
in a way that's effective and like easy to understand or something like that. I really want to uh, quickly answer some of the questions that have come over Zoom. Is H5P instead of Blackboard? H5P would be something you would embed in Blackboard. So it's something that you put into your LMS um, to augment the content that's already in there. Have you seen any issues using different browsers like Edge versus Chrome? So I haven't experienced any issues between browsers, but I pretty much, I use Safari, Firefox, and Chrome exclusively. I don't know if anybody, do y'all use Edge or? No issues on any of the browsers. No I've, issues. I've, I've I personally have not experienced it. You heard it here first. No issues. So, okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's all we have time for, but we'll be hanging around if y'all have any questions. Thank you so much.